All right, good morning. Oh, come on, you can do better than that. Good morning. Hey, all right. It's my pleasure and honor to introduce our keynote speaker today, Tim Lewis, a professor of special education at the University of Missouri. Now, Tim comes to us with over 30 years of experience as a researcher, as a scholar, as an implementer. He has been a teacher. He was a special ed teacher in school and classrooms for kids with EBD. He took, and this is important, he took his PhD at the University of Oregon working with George Sugai. So really, everything that George knows, Tim taught him during, during that, that period. Um, Tim actually, a fascinating thing, he sits on over 13 editorial boards. So those of you who are graduate students and you're thinking about uh, publishing your dissertation, Tim Lewis is one of the people who's very likely to be looking at the work you do. He has been successful in funding over $38 million worth of federal grants. So those of you in state and districts that are getting ready to write grants, I strongly encourage you to come up and connect with Tim. He also, he's not just a co-director of the National PBIS Center, he also is director of the Missouri PBIS uh, efforts. Recently, and this is really neat, this is great, just in the next few weeks, he will be awarded the University of Missouri's Distinguished Faculty Award. Now this is something they don't do very often, and definitely, It is. It's, it's really pretty neat. It's, listen, I've got to tell you, it's hard to get universities to acknowledge anything. So th this is really something that is, that is impressive. Now, in part, Tim comes to us. He's going to speak to us about 25 years' worth of lessons learned. Uh, and doing that in the small amount of time he has is fairly impressive. But part of what I really want to bring to mind is Tim brings not just a wealth of knowledge, but he brings the innovation, he brings the creativity, he brings the emphasis on precision in implementing PBIS that has earned him basically sort of the reputation as the, the Steve Jobs of PBIS, all right? So please join me in welcoming Tim Lewis. Now you're gonna walk, watch how he limps up coming to the, the podium. All the rumors that George Sugai put out that he's doing this just to get sympathy are false. He actually has a broken foot, but is, is coming to us and interested in providing the data, uh, sharing with us his information. So please join me with sympathy and goodwill in welcoming Tim Lewis. Yeah, no sympathy needed. Um, good morning, everybody. The first challenging task for me is I was instructed to stand here. Uh, and if you've ever seen me speak, I don't like to stand here. I like to move. Uh, so that's going to be a, a tall order for me to stand still. Uh, if I move, the video guy will get very, very upset with me. Um, the theme of the conference this year is sustainability, scalability. Uh, and so I thought I would kind of walk you through, I think I have six lessons learned, kind of big ideas. Um, I actually was on the ball and got this to the folks, so it's on the app, but as always, <laughs> on those long airplane rides and sitting in the hotel room, I tweak and I play around, I'll make sure I get this posted as well. So if there are additional slides or the orders change, we'll get you that final copy, okay? All right, I've got about an hour, as, as Rob said, to talk about stuff we've been doing for over 25 years now. As he indicated, I had the good fortune to go to the University of Oregon, and while I was there working with George Sagai and Jeff Colvin and others, we all had that same story. We all, in our teaching past, had a self-contained classroom at the high school level for kids with emotional behavior disorders. And we all talked about how when the guys were in our room, mostly guys, right? Every now and then we'd have a young woman, uh, mostly guys, but ladies, you know, don't fret. The fastest growing segment of violent offenders in the United States are young women, so girl power, keep it up. 
When the guys were in our room, they were okay. They're on task, they follow directions, they got along, but the bell would ring. And as we said, all hell would break loose. And I taught in the dark ages, and so it was about the kid, we gotta fix the kid. Well, as I said, I had the good fortune to go to the University of Oregon, and while I was there, we started thinking about, well, you know, there's zero magic that we have as special educators. There was no special things we did in those self-contained classrooms. What we did is we matched instruction and environmental supports to the kids. And so that sort of took us to our work thinking about, well, since there's no magic, can we actually take this to scale? Can we take it in other classrooms? Can we take it school-wide? Can we get, take it district-wide? Can we take it statewide? Uh, and it's been really fun over the last couple of uh, decades. We now are in entire nations that are implementing school-wide PBS. So it's been, a, it's been a really, really fascinating and enjoyable, and in no way when we started this did I ever think we would be here. Uh, it's a little bit daunting, a little bit scary, particularly looking out at this room, uh, the number of folks who are here who are already converted, right? I'm preaching to the choir, so my job is a little bit easier this morning. Okay, anytime I do a talk about PBS or behavior, I start with this slide, so if you've ever heard me speak, you've seen this slide, and everybody hates this slide. I always point out, look, I can't make kids behave. No one in this room can make children behave, nor can we make them learn. The good news is, as educators, we can create environments to increase the likelihood. And when I ask for academic examples, it, it, it comes to bear, right? I'll ask a second grade teacher, hey, you got a little one that's really struggling to learn to read. What would you do? Well, I'd give more practice. What if that doesn't work? Well, I'd talk to my colleagues about ideas. What if that doesn't work? Well, I'd talk to a literacy person. What if that doesn't work? Well, then maybe I'd start talking to her special ed colleagues. Maybe he's got a disability. In other words, that teacher tells me he or she would put more and more supports in the environment to increase the likelihood they learn to read. But then I ask that same teacher, oh, you've got another one, and he's kicking and biting and spitting. Gone. He's got to be in my room. I want you to think about kids with challenging behavior just like kids who are struggling to read. The process is the same. What supports can we put in the environment to increase the likelihood children master social skills, just like we increase the likelihood they master academic skills? And what we know now from, again, long time of research and, and practical application is that environments increase the likelihood are guided by a core curriculum and input with consistency and fidelity. We knew we frustrated you the very first time your school team went to a PBS training. And we said, look, we're not going to give you the answer. We're going to give you a structure. We're going to give you features. You have to adapt and adopt. You have to make this fit your context. But you need to implement with consistency and fidelity. We know that we frustrated you a bit at front, but we also know that without making it fit your context, we'd have limited to no success. All right? OK, so as I said, I want to walk you through about six lessons. Lesson one, be prepared for the next big thing by continuing to implement school-wide PBS logic. When people ask me on the elevator, what do you do? I do a lot of work around kids with challenging behavior, particularly looking at school-wide PBS. It's like, well, what is school-wide PBS? And I characterize it as a problem-solving framework. It's not a package, it's not a program, it's not even a curriculum. It's a logic to help school teams identify their own unique challenges, put in clear practices, and then build systems. And yes, don't panic, I will show you circles and triangles at some point. <laughs> If I don't, I have really bad withdrawal, right? <laughs> I joke, since I'm one of the co-directors, I'm federally required by law to show circles and triangles, so you will see them at some point. And then build a continuum of supports, meaning if you do these things, regardless of what comes down the pike, you are prepared. I can't tell you the number of frustrating experiences where I've been working with schools and they're doing some great stuff, and all of a sudden, oh, the district's mandating, we've got to do a bullying program. And so they scrap what they're doing, and they go out and they try to buy something. And I said, no, no, no. If you're doing school-wide PBS, if you're engaging in a problem-solving framework, if you're looking at data around bullying and harassment, and you're building a continuum of supports, you are implementing the best we have to address bullying behavior, right? So there's always the latest greatest. We always have some new issue, such as poverty addressing us, right? Fetal alcohol syndrome, academic benchmarks, zero tolerance, diets to cure, insert syndrome here, right? Bullying national core standards, high-functioning autism, ASD, vaping, trauma, right? Trauma is the buzz now. Everybody's talking about trauma, trauma, trauma. Fidget spinners. <laughs> I have one. <laughs> I'm here to tell you it doesn't work. <laughs> it fascinates me for about 30 seconds, and then I get bored. 
but I thought I'd give it a fair go. And then recently, uh, all of you have to be aware of bears <laughs> and <laughs> alternative facts math. <laughs> I know I'm on thin ice because I'm federally funded, but um, <laughs> I was horrified when our esteemed secretary pointed out Trump's rating was 35% and she said, that means more than half people think he's doing a good job. <laughs> and the reporter said, no, that would be 50%. Alternative facts math, so yes. So in other words, you are ready for, and then wham, this thing came out of left field, right? Now, if you don't laugh, it's over. <laughs> I'm keeping you after. <laughs> okay, here are the circles. Again, it's not a program, it's not a package, it's a problem-solving framework, data practice systems. We drew these circles over 20 years ago, and yes, George has things spinning and popping in and out and so forth, but it still holds true. If you ask me a question, if you say we're struggling with this, this is the logic I'm gonna steer you to. First of all, we've gotta look at data. We've gotta match practices to data. Before you ever implement something, how are you gonna progress monitor? Data, data, data. And then the most important, systems, systems, systems. I tell teams, look, this is about kid behavior, but 95% of your time is about adult behavior. And that's not being disrespectful at all. It's acknowledging those of us in higher education do not prepare educators and administrators to deal with the social emotional challenges they see in schools. We know we haven't given you those skills. We know that we've built these parallel systems. We know that if we're gonna be successful, we have gotta support each other. It's all about how we support each other. In the past in education, we've always kind of taken this problem solving framework, but a lot of times we've been inefficient. Thank God we made it out in time. Of course, now we're equally screwed. For too many years, we've tried to engage in this, this sort of problem solving and not been very successful. There are the triangles. Okay, I feel better now. If you, in essence, are building a continuum of evidence-based practices, if your data are driving and guiding what practices you put in place, and if you are carefully spending time addressing and supporting each other, it doesn't matter what comes down the pike. You are prepared to do it. And that's, again, one of those really important lessons we have learned. Things will come and go. New issues will come and go. Stay the course. Keep doing what you're doing. You are prepared to address that new insert issue or initiative here. Okay, lesson two. Behavioral experts in the room. How many of you are school psychs, special educators, counselors, social workers? Your job should be to put yourself out of business, right? When I work with schools and districts, I say my goal is to put myself out of business. In other words, I want to build enough capacity in that school where they don't need me. And we've been successful to some degree. Now, the sort of unfortunate good news is those of us who deal with kids with challenging behavior, we've got pretty darn good job security. All right? We're not going to ameliorate all of the challenges and all the problems. But think of it this way. Instead of going case by case, instead of putting out fires, start shifting some of your time and energy to the team. So I still get calls from districts, say, Tim, can you please help us with this kid? We have never seen a kid like this. You guys got this kid, right? Everybody's got this kid. <laughs> Some of you have these kids. Everybody's got this kid. And my response is, no, I won't help you with that kid and that teacher. But I'd be happy to come to your school and work with a team because I don't have any special powers. I have a set of skills that I can teach anybody. And I also know that, yes, this kid came to the top, but there are nine others just waiting their turn to become this kid. I'd much rather focus behavioral expertise in building capacity in the school team. Again, that's another lesson learned over the many years. In fact, if you look at sort of uh, work in Gusky and others that look at professional development and look at how we sort of really impact teacher change, what a lot of people wanna do is start with beliefs, right? And I say, no, 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 it's not about beliefs. It's about, in essence, giving teachers skills to solve their problems. When people ask me, how do you get buy-in? I say, you get buy-in by helping make my life better. If you help me solve a challenge, if you help me become a better teacher, I'm all bought in, right? So you always start, again, with data. You start with the problem. You put in skill-based instruction. 
teach me what to do when that kid does X, Y, Z. Then, when I see kid change in behavior, now I believe. I have a colleague who has a great line that I always use with my school teams. They're like, look, I'm not asking anybody to buy today. Just rent it for a while, okay? Just rent it. You can buy later. So as you think about, and the folks out there with behavioral expertise, move away from putting out fires, build capacity in those school teams. Lesson three. One of the things we've learned is that nobody owns tier two. Tier one, yep, we're all on board. We got code of conduct. We've got a team. It's school wide. We're all on the same page. Historically, tier three, we've got school psychologists and social workers and counselors and special educators with great expertise to deal with those really intensive kids. Who owns tier two? And I've seen way too many schools will implement a full continuum or they'll implement tier two, but then that person leaves and it all disappears. Or the other thing we do is we don't develop ways to track and progress monitor those kids. So as I leave elementary into the middle, nobody has a clue at the middle that I was on a tier two support. And it'll take me to about October and people say, wow, we probably should do something for Tim. He's misbehaving. And they'll reinvent the wheel. The other thing we know is that no single school that I've encountered has enough expertise in-house to really implement and deliver high fidelity tier two, tier three. Tier three will require district supports. When we first started this, we sort of let schools get to the outcome taking any path they wanted. And we carefully studied those essential features. I'm at the point now, and my colleagues are at the point now, where we're being a little bit more prescriptive at tier two, tier three. And so we're working in about six, seven districts now, building district-wide tier two, tier three processes. It's going to require district resources anyway. And those folks who typically provide that behavioral expertise aren't building bound. And so they're thrilled because they'll share with us, yeah, there's 90 schools in this district, and every building I walk into uses a different form, different process, different sort of approach. This would be fantastic. Now, yes, you adapt and adopt to fit your local need and developmentally, whether you're at sort of primary into secondary. But let's sort of take the burden off that school to seek this out and build it. Let's build it district-wide, right? And so that's what we've been doing. We've been looking at sort of common uh, ways to identify kids. So yes, your rule might be three majors and two minors, and the high school might be two minors and one major. That's OK. But we're giving you the templates. We're limiting the range of practices, particularly at tier two. We pretty much look at self-management, check and check out, or check and connect, or check, connect, and expect, social skill instruction, and academic supports. And we find, particularly at tier two, that pretty much hits 99.9% .9 of kiddos. I would strongly encourage all of you to get the tiered fidelity inventory and use that as your roadmap. For those of you at tier one moving into tier two, or tier two moving into tier three, read ahead. Take a look at those essential features. Think about ways that within your districts or within your regions, you can help build that capacity, okay? See, this is usually where I ask for questions, but I don't think questions will go well in a room that holds 2,200 people. So I'm gonna keep moving on. <laughs> Lesson four, it's still all about the classroom. I remember, again, 20 plus years ago now, sitting in the room at the University of Oregon and we were sort of conceptualizing uh, what it might look like school-wide and we talked about school-wide and we talked about non-classroom settings and we talked about individual students. You know, and I kept saying, it's still all about the classroom. Kids spend most of their day in the classroom. That's where if you look at your data, kids are getting sent out of the classroom and so forth. We have got to figure out how we not literally break down walls, but figuratively break down walls and build that capacity to work collaboratively and support each other, right? Why? <laughs> because all of you at some point will have a kid like Nigel. Nigel fails the attitude <laughs> test. <coughs> I know where your humor ever is now. All right, I got the sweet spot. <laughs> now, within school PBS, we talk a lot about essential features. We talk about observable measurable. We talk about sort of task analyzing steps and making sure we implement and hold true to good science. At the same time, there's this intangible. Uh, and Catherine Bradshaw did a great job yesterday kind of operationally defining climate. 
You don't want to look, overlook that climate. There's that intangible that's equally important. To me, climate's an outcome, right? So we improve school climate, that's an outcome. But we can do things to foster and develop. So one of the things I ask educators all the time is think about your favorite elementary school teacher. So think about your favorite elementary school teacher. Hopefully you have one. I'm such a, an education nerd, I can name all of mine. <laughs> In fact, it occurred to me about five years ago, since I have been three years old, I've spent every, life, every, every year of my life in school, either as a teacher or as a student. In fact, I like school so much, I like taking tests. I'll go take the GRE, oh, I just want to see how they change it, but secretly I love it. <laughs> I'm in a 12-step program, <laughs> I'm making progress, so there is hope. Think about your favorite elementary school teacher. I don't know who it is, but I bet there were two things in common. First, they love teaching, and it was apparent to you, right? It was apparent to you. I had a fifth grade teacher that should have retired years ago. She would show up in the morning, sit in her chair with wheels, and that's where she stayed the rest of the day. So if you raised your hand, Back to her desk. <laughs> I don't think I ever saw that woman got out of her chair except for when it was lunchtime. <laughs> Even as a fifth grader, we're thinking, you know, Mrs. X, maybe you should sell real estate. <laughs> <clears throat> they love teaching. Second, you thought you were the teacher's pet. I'm gonna let you know on a secret. Every kid in that classroom thought he or she was the teacher's pet. When you look at the resiliency literature, kids that just grow up in horrible circumstances, but get out. They all tell very different stories, but one common theme. They all talk about an adult who individually recognized and valued something in them, right? You want to individually recognize and value something in every one of your kids. Here's one of my favorite elementary school teachers. That's Mrs. Johnson, third grade. And yes, I am in that picture. There, oops, there I am. <laughs> very near Mrs. Johnson, as it should be, right? <laughs> because I was the only pet in that class. No, I guarantee you, everybody in that class thought he or she was Mrs. Johnson's pet. So yes, it's important to teach, and yes, it's important to practice. It's important to give feedback, but you also want to create an environment where you like coming to work. Think about those connections. Think about the atmosphere. Is it friendly and helpful? Think about how staff interact with each other. The study that I would love to conduct, and I keep threatening to do it, I just need to do it, is bullying behavior among teachers because I unfortunately see it, and so do the kids. Think about how we interact with each other. Think about how we interact to kids, and kids to adults. One of my soapbox things I get on is when adults talk about how children are so disrespectful, and then I watch them engage in such disrespectful behaviors to the kids. It's like we always have to be the example. We always have to be the model. When I work with our special ed undergraduates, I tell them the hardest thing you will ever have to do in your career is you will have one of your students trash your classroom, call you horrible names, hit you and bite you and spit on you. In the afternoon, you've got to reinforce the hell out of them. It's going to be the hardest thing you ever have to do because we take behavior personal. It's not personal to a kid, right? We know that that behavior serves a function. We have always have to be the model. So I ask teachers, would you send your kids to the school you work in? And if your answer is no, why not? I have two barometers that I use to gauge the climate of schools. The first is how I'm treated when I walk into the office. I always follow rules, I always check in. Am I ignored and then grunted at? Or even if it's busy, somebody says, hey, welcome to our school, hang on a second, I'll be with you in a minute. Great. And the other thing I do is I go into your staff room and I have my computer out, it looks like I'm working, but I'm listening, right? I'm listening. And what I observe in schools where I know I'd like to work here, Teachers will come in and, my favorite Aussie term, they'll whinge a bit about kids, right? They'll gripe a bit, but then they start problem solving, right? You'll hear teachers, oh yeah, I had a kid do that, this really worked well. Or, well, did you know that they got kicked out and he's living in his car again? I didn't know that. So those two things pretty much tell me, yes, this is a place I want to work. Or, mm, no, maybe I don't want to work here, and I need to change that. So yes, it's important to follow those essential features equally important to develop that climate. You want to have fun. This is a place that kids want to be connected. So I've got a couple lists and they're very long. You've got this, you know, to kind of reflect upon. This is a list I love uh, from Ed Kamei Nui and Deb Simmons. It's a chapter out of a classroom management textbook. But I love this list of expectations. 
And I ask teachers to think about all of these and answer these questions, but you've got to consider, do children have the prerequisite and requisite skills to meet that expectation, right? A couple that I really love is, how do I want kids to remember me when the last day of school and I'm no longer part of their lives? I still remember Mrs. Johnson, right? She was a hero to me. You want to be a hero to all these kids. How can I change my instruction to help kids be successful? A few years ago, University of Missouri, we got a pretty innovative teacher ed program where we get our kids out in schools right away and then their senior year, they do an entire year in a school. We offer the courses there, we push into site, we integrate all the things. And so we had a little brown bag and some of the students were talking about their experience. And they were working in one of my schools, a title building, and they all had the same story. Yes, we worked for hours, we had this lesson plan, we put it in place and it went south. So we all went home, had a good cry, <laughs> and then we reconvened and met. Um, and, and sometimes when the lesson's not going well, there are MU faculty, so they'll sort of come up and kind of do some really sort of quick on the spot. And they were sort of talking, and I finally raised my hand. I said, you know, you, you don't know me. Uh, I'm in special education, and I, I mostly work with doctoral students. But I have to tell you, you guys have a really important message here that I don't want you to lose. Every one of you kept saying, how can I change my instruction to help kids be successful? I never heard, well, that's a special ed kid. He should go there. I never heard, well, where's the counselor? I never heard, this kid doesn't belong here. You all kept talking about how you could change your instruction and you don't want to lose that. So critical, so essential. And yes, there are essential features within classroom practices. Um, and I'll, I'll sort of prompt you uh, towards the end here about some resources where you can get a lot more information about the classroom. And I know there are lots of classroom sessions across the forum. I'd really encourage you to keep taking a look at them. Now, the challenge with classroom supports, and again, this is one of those lessons learned over many, many years, is how do we ensure everyone including our brand new teachers, including our substitutes, right? Including those misassigned or temporarily certified folks. You know, demographers tell us it's, it's only gonna get worse. The only upside <laughs> to the real estate market crashing our economy is the baby boomers had to stay in profession a little bit longer because all of our, uh, you know, retirement got tanked. But they're leaving. Uh, and we know there are going to be critical shortages, and already colleges and universities are lining up to do those quickie uh, cert online kind of programs that all the evidence show don't adequately prepare teachers to deal with some of the challenges. And all of you deal with Calvin's. Ms. Warmwood, yes, Calvin, you can present the material, but you can't make me care. Rumor has it she's up to two packs a day unfiltered, right? <laughs> We're always going to have challenges. So, um, a little bit of plug to the amazing colleagues that I have in my center in Missouri. I encourage you to go to our website, and we've got lots of classroom supports. We have these little mini modules, we call them. We're developing these great virtual modules. We're showing examples across elementary and high school. So lots of good resources. When it comes to classroom, here's a lesson learned, and you guys basically shape this. I talked to teachers, and I said, well, you know, tell me about the best way to support you in the classroom. And the response was, well, I need it when I need it. I'm like, what does that mean? It's like, don't send me to the three-day workshop before school starts and teach me 90 things to do. I need it when I've tried everything I know and it's not working. So we've gotten away from the three-day workshops. We've moved to 10, 15-minute in-services around classroom supports. We focus as an entire school on one practice, right? So we'll do 10 minutes on opportunities to respond. People go away, right? We kind of give examples, non-examples, we give worksheets. The other critical essential piece is supporting each other once we do the lesson. Just like our kids, we teach, we've got to give high rates of feedback. Now we're a little bit more efficient learners than children, but we learn the same way. And if we don't get feedback, we're not going to master. The other challenge that I see, when I had that list of eight up there very, very briefly, hopefully all of you are like, yeah, I'm doing that, I'm doing that, I'm doing that, and it's true, you are. But are you doing it with enough intensity to match the challenges of the kids in your classroom? One of the things we know is that we're drawing kids out of poverty, we're drawing kids in high-risk environments, we can't get away with the minimum. We've got to do the maximum. Terry Scott and colleagues just came out with a book where they have summarized thousands of observations of what goes on in classrooms 
I'd really encourage you to take a look at that in terms of where we're on target and where we need a little bit more work. So here's the logic. Lesson learned. We've gotten away from the big long in-service. Ten minutes. We're all going to focus on opportunities to respond in this school. For the next month, for the next six weeks, we've had schools do an entire school year. We're just going to focus on that one skill. We're then going to provide lots of performance feedback. So we do a lot of peer coaching, right? So Brandy and I get along okay. I find 10 minutes, I can go into her classroom, and I just count the number of opportunities to respond. I leave that on her desk, I go away. We don't meet, I don't write up an evaluation, I just have the number. She picks it up, ooh, I'm a little low. She goes back to her little tip sheet that you can get again on the web. Maybe I'll try the whiteboards tomorrow. And she finds 10 minutes, she can come to my class and do the same thing. Principles, you're supposed to do walkthroughs. Typically, you're a really disruptive factor. You come in and the kids are, what the hell are you doing here, right? <laughs> We've armed our principals with this little app that, again, Terry Scott and colleagues helped develop with a, 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 a tech for. So they go in, opportunities respond, tap, 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 they count, they hit send, it goes to your email. You're the only one that holds the data. We make real clear rules when we get to classroom. You, the teacher, are the only one that have your data. The only exception is we, we, we take names off and we look at it as, as a school. So we make lots of clear rules. This is not about evaluation. You're the only one with data. It's about that good to great concept. It's about making sure we're implementing consistently and with fidelity. Classrooms, classrooms, classrooms. I can't underscore enough. Okay, lesson five. We started in schools and we tried to engage families um, with limited success. We've tried a little bit in community, but for the most part, we're educators. And when I work with my schools, I always tell them, look, get your house in order first. Build within your school, then reach out. Engage your families, engage your community. And there are lots of different ways we can do that. But I'm still a fan and still, again, a lesson learned. Get that foundation then reach out. Because what I've seen happen, if people bring all the players to the table, it's unwieldy. And we all kind of speak different languages, and we're not quite sure of funding, and are we violating rules, and so forth. So we get our house in order first, and then we reach out. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the strategies we've used to engage families and students and communities, OK? There's a great resource on the website. Uh, Mark Wiest and colleagues put together an ebook. It's all about engaging families through the lens and structure and framework of PBIS. So you can go to our website, <coughs> download a copy. Lots of great resources and ideas in there. I encourage all of you to take a look at that. I want to share a couple stories uh, from schools we've worked with. And the first is Benton Elementary. And I would describe Benton Elementary as having what I call reluctant families. Meaning, you go to back to school night and it's like a scene out of the Old West. You know, tumbleweeds are blowing down the hallways because there's nobody there. Title building, highly transient population, all of the challenges and risks that come uh, within this, this, this sort of the school that, and again, all of you, I'm sure, uh, have worked in or know of. Very small PTA. In fact, the teachers pretty much fund everything they do. Uh, there's a couple parents that would show up to PTA didn't have money, so they, they pretty much continue to pay. Um, and again, they sent out lots of information about PBS, but they, they wanted to say, you know what, we don't have a presence in our school of families. And so they wanted to try to increase that connection and partnership. T Tier one was in place, high fidelity, doing some great stuff for kids. So here's what they did. One, they defined family in the very broadest sense. So the very first thing they did is they asked kids, bring a picture of your family. And right when you walked in the school, they had this big wall of all the families. And it was fantastic, because the kids love to see their family, and they like to talk about, oh, your family is an aunt, or your family is grandma and a brother and an uncle, and your family is, and all the different variations, right? It wasn't the 2.5 kids and the dog. So we sent this message that families are who you're with, not this preconceived notion. Second, they used the logic of PBS to try to increase family participation. So they're the Benton Bees, because they have three bees, that's their mascot, so they created what they call this buzz passport. And the logic was they wanted to combine school-based activities with all of the good literature about how parents can engage kids. 
Most of these kids go home from school, sit in front of the TV. When they're hungry, they go down to the gas station, buy some crap, right? That's food. We feed them breakfast, we feed them lunch. Every Friday, probably 80% of the kids leave with a buddy pack full of food. So there's not a lot of family engagement, unfortunately, with a lot of, a lot of the kids in this school. So here's what they did. This is the outside, it was a trifold, right? And so they said, look, parents, if you get your passport stamped at the end of each term, there were trimesters, so the end of each trimester, you can earn a pizza. A local pizza place said, yep, we will donate as many pizzas as you want if you can get kids and families. This is a great thing to invest. And the logic was, you're making progress, have dinner with your family. So here's what it looked like, right? So they could get stamps in each one of these activities. So you see, it's just attend to a meeting. And then on the center there, you know, have lunch with your child at school. And then on the red activities, the far right side, things to do at home. Have a no TV night. Uh, do a puzzle. Read a book. So we put this in place. And as parents came, they'd get their passport stamped. And again, we made it big fun. We didn't make it like you're bad parents, you're not doing the right thing. You know, we got the kids engaged and, and so forth and so on. And then each trimester, we kind of upped the ante, if you will, getting them to participate a little bit more, uh, moving into more of those home-based and community-based activities. And by the third trimester, it's like fill in the blank. You guys know what to do for your kids, right? So what was the outcome? Well, they had, <laughs> it's a small school, 70 passports validated. They saw significant increases in all of their activities. Uh, the PTA, the Chili Fun Night, um, assemblies. They take their entire school. I live in Columbia, Missouri, right in the middle of Missouri. St. Louis Zoo is two hours away, amazing zoo. They take their entire school to the zoo, which is, is a, you know, a big task. And they need parent volunteers, increase there. So the big culminating event was the sock hop. So they have the school dance, and in the past, Parents would drop their kids off and then they were gone, right? They said, nope, we want to build community. Bring your family to the sock hop. So it's a tiny gym and it was packed. Full disclosure, my wife teaches at this school. And she came home from the sock hop and she reeked. I said, honey, you smell horrible. <laughs> but she was just beaming. She's like, you would not believe. It's like, it was packed, wall to wall people. Nobody sat down. It time to end, nobody wanted to leave. It's like this is the first time ever in this school we felt like we're part of the community. And the family said the same thing. My other favorite story in the sock hop, the principal was out front greeting uh, you know, parents and families and the configuration that came in. And there was a little first grader and they came by and she's like, all right, mom, we're going in. At Benton, we're safe, respectful learners. That means when we walk down the hallway, you keep to the right, hands and feet to self. And the mom's like, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, the principal's like, yay. <laughs> so Benton has been my favorite story for a long time. Um, I had the good fortune to do a lot of work in Australia. Uh, and I was in Western Australia a few months ago, way in um, within the interior. And I have my new favorite community parent building. Anybody know about cane toads? Cane toads were imported from Hawaii to Queensland because they grow a lot of sugar cane and insects were eating it. So they brought these toads over to eat the insects. Well, what happened is there's no predator to cane toads. Nothing eats cane toads because they actually are poisonous. So they have proliferated to the point where they've gone entire, across the entire continent and they're now a pest in Western Australia. So they had this cane toad hunt. So in the evening at night, all the families came in the school and you round up cane toads. Now it's, it's, it's very humane. Um, they put them in a bag and then they freeze them and then they actually turn them into fertilizer. So it, it comes out okay. But there... <laughs> but what happened on the cane toad hunt, this particular school serves a very large Aboriginal community. Uh, and Aboriginal communities don't have, for the most part, written language. They're very oral, traditional. And some of the you know, folks that's like, you know, we, we support you, but the way you talk about respect and this, that, those aren't the words we use. And so they said, well, well, how would you phrase it? And so they met with these folks during the cane toad hunt and created sort of Aboriginal translations. And it's sort of in Creole, it's a mixture of Aboriginal terms and English and so forth. But they talked about just that one simple event fundamentally changed how that community viewed school and how they now have people coming into the school. And now that they see each other, because they're in a small town and they say hello, they chat, how's it going, and they check in. Look for ways to engage your families. Get your house in order, but then open the doors. 
if you've got those reluctant families, incentivize it. I mean, I tell schools, just do real simple things. Uh, my kids are long graduated now, but I remember when they were in elementary school, I'd get that thing home about volunteering. And I would love to, but my schedule is chaos. I can't say, yeah, I'll be there once a week or once a month. But sports day, you bet, saw my calendar, solve it, held on to it. I tell them, send things home like invite people, hey, can you help set up chairs for a meeting? Sure, I can do that. Just get them across the threshold. Now you've got their ear and you can talk about how much we love having their kids in school and how important it is to make those connections. Another favorite story real quick. Uh, when we first started this, again, in Eugene, Oregon, I worked with a school, a small school, no resources, um, and, you know, they were given PBS. They were one of our early adopters. They were kind of a, you know, a test site for us. Um, and I remember they put together their PBS handbook, and they put little vignettes of themselves in this handbook, and they said, Tim, can you take a look at it? It's like, sure. And so I'm reading the stories about the teachers, and they're all like, you know, I love to read and sail, and one's like, well, I've got two cats, they're named this. And so I met with them, I said, this is great, guys, but in none of your vignettes do you say you like teaching my kid? And they're like, well, we don't. <laughs> I'm like, well, let's not communicate that. <laughs> and they said, we've all requested transfers, we're not supported, we hate being in this school, we want to get out. And so they had nowhere else to go, so they said, okay, we'll give PBS a go. So they did. And they got some great things in place. Well, the district was reorganizing, and they were going to shut this school down and combine them with a new school. So all of the teachers got together, went in front of the school board and said, we understand you have to do that, but we all want to go together as faculty, and we want all of our students to go with us. They had built that environment to increase the likelihood to the point where they didn't want to lose traction. They didn't want to lose that success. Engage your families. Another important piece, engage the kids. Right? Squad PBS is something we do with children and adolescents, not to them. Engage them. They can be a member of the school PBS team. Now, if we're talking about kids and teachers, they're not, they're not there, right? The same with a parent volunteer or a member. Look at leaderships, uh, groups that you already have in place. Make those connect points. Have the kids set goals. Have the kids participate. One of my favorites, school in Kansas City, uh, high school, you know, they had the matrix and they taught and practiced and they, they were doing some great things. Well, the student PBS group got together and created a matrix for teachers. And they presented it to the staff at a faculty meeting. And they said, look, you know, you want us to be on time. Why is it okay for you to wander in three minutes late? You say we can't have food or beverages in class. Why do you walk in with a cup of coffee and that donut? And, and they said, look, we know this is where you work. And the teachers are like, Damn, they got us. <laughs> and they did it in a respectful way, but it started that conversation. The kids were saying, hey, you keep saying this is our school, then let's make it our school. Let's hold all of ourselves accountable to these expectations. And they did it in a really, really nice way. I want to share another high school example. This comes from Sydney, Australia. Uh, and this school has done amazing. This is one of those schools, uh, high poverty, high crime, that neighborhood is so violent. Uh, in fact, in this area, uh, another fun fact, um, I did this workshop for teachers with really intense behaviors. And one of the challenges they had were kids smoking. And I said, well, you know, most, most campuses have given it up. And you know, they're like, well, we can't. We are a tire, you know, drug-free campus. And they said, well, you know, it's, it's a real problem. I said, why is it a problem? They said, well, the average age kids start smoking in this community is six. <laughs> and I had this image of a kid in a onesie, you know, with the cigarettes rolled up in there. <laughs> so this is a really impacted community. They've done some amazing things. And I want to just sort of share a real quick snippet. Um, the kids got together and started this kindness. And they had the year of kindness. They saw a lot of bullying, a lot of harassment, it's a very ethnically, religiously, and, and language uh, diverse school. And so, as is true, kids are much more creative than we are. Uh, so they put together this video, and I want to just show you a couple minutes of it, because it's, it's, it's just fun. Um, and, and if we cannot be clever, we can always be kind. Sharif is an awesome person, and he's very kind, he's modest, um, he's always been there for me, and I really appreciate everything he does for me. Definition, kind, adjective, of a good or benevolent nature or disposition. Kindness, a concept that is supposed to be universally known, but in today's society is strangely alien. 
It is said that kindness is extinct, for we live in a world of nuclear war, tyranny, disease, hunger. Yes, there are some bad things in the world. But doesn't one act of kindness, no matter how small, just make the world that little bit better? So you get the concept, and it goes on, and they have the kids interview each other, and, and is it? they had big fun with it. And they had kindness ambassadors, you know, and they made a point as new kids, because highly transient population came in, they'd hook them up with a kindness ambassador, and they would introduce them to their friends and so forth. So engage kids. Uh, Montana has been doing an amazing job. Where are my friends from Montana? Anybody here? Yay. Um, They've been doing a great job with kids. You know, they call it the MBI, the Montana Behavior Initiative, and they have youth days. And one of the things they do is they survey all the kids across the state. And I want to share just some of their data real quickly. And one of the things that we always sort of pre-correct when teachers look at this is, yes, this is perception data, and it may not be accurate, but it, their perception is their reality. And it's really important to kind of look at this, such as teachers make an effort to get to know me, a little bit over 50%. Now, that may not be the case, but if students are reporting that, we need to do something about that, right? We need to do a better job of connecting. Remember I talked about individually recognizing and valuing something in every kid. Other highlights, my parents care about my education, 95% of kids. We have this perception sometimes parents don't care, they don't show up to meetings, we never hear from them. They care. They've got two jobs. They're doing the best they can. They themselves may have had sc horrible school experiences. School's not a, a friendly, happy place for them. But overwhelming, kids say, yes, my parents care. Um, teachers respect students, about 66%. We've got to do something about that. Other things, teachers enjoy working with students, about two-thirds. Now again, we need to be a parent. Remember my two characteristics. They love their job and they connect with kids. Other things, students have a voice in decision making, less than half. We want them to have a voice. If we're gonna do this, we do that with them, not to them. Other things, uh, teachers encourage students to make decisions. Good news is it's fairly high. We use these data then and the team, the leadership team in the state looks at that and they start thinking about how can we embed some of these strategies within our supports. How can we work with teams of kids to take ownership as well as teachers to address that? Another quick example I want to share with you. This comes from, from my state uh, down in the southwest area. They were implementing um, and the kids were saying, you know, this is all well and good and you guys talk about expectations. We just hear rules and what we're not supposed to do. So they organized a student panel and they wanted to make sure that they had a wide range of voices. So the panel, right, getting kids involved in decisions, less focus on the rules, more about school, they very strategically sampled across all the populations. Meaning, typically, we always have the same kids volunteer for everything. The honor roll kids, the athletes, you know, the good kids, quote unquote, they made a point. In fact, they had a big group of goth kids. You all know goth, right? They're always in black and despair and woe is us. They had goth kids on the PBS team, you know. I'm sure there was some cognitive dissonance for them, but they were there, they had a voice, right? So they wanted to make sure when they talked about things, everybody had a say to try to engage. So they took over the teaching. Teachers weren't real keen to do it. They kind of hit and miss. They said, you know what, we'll do it. And as always, they're much more clever. So they created really fun, innovative ways and videos. So they had the cyberbullying, uh, the lunch card monster, and they did some really, really clever things. My favorite is everybody has bathroom expectations, right? So they created this little video and, and acronym talking about hush, flush, wash, and rush. <laughs> and because they created it, they owned it. And you know what they kept telling us is like it's less about rules. You guys are always telling us what to do. It's like, no, we don't want nasty bathrooms. We would like to be in there and safe and it's clean and so forth. Let us own it. The other clever thing they did is, right, everybody needs to use the restroom at some point. So they created what they call the Stall Street Journal. <laughs> and so above the urinals in the men's room and in the ladies, you know, in the back of, of the stall, just real quick facts. There's always a little clip about PBS and the expectation, upcoming events and so forth. They also took over the incentive system. So their mascot were the Panthers, so they had these Panther power tickets, they called them, right? And they had different levels and so forth. 
kids were much more inclined to work towards those because they had a voice, and these were things that they valued. They also wanted to reach beyond the school walls, and so they created their school at PBS Facebook page. And they encouraged all the parents to subscribe to this, to you know, know what's going on in school and what we're about and so forth. <coughs> engage your families, engage your students. A lesson learned. Talk about sustainability, talk about scalability. You get those folks, it becomes how we do business. It's very difficult for it to disappear. The final lesson. We talk a lot about schools, but as Rob has taught us, schools are collections of individuals, highly different individuals. And in my language, teachers are on a very lean schedule of reinforcement, right? When's the last time somebody came in and said, hey, you're doing a great job, keep it up, <laughs> right? We're on a very, very lean schedule. So do things as a PBS team to celebrate and acknowledge and recognize your colleagues. I remember one of my um, model demonstration sites, one of my sort of research schools, it was you know, sort of the end of winter and people were worn down and tired. And so I had my team do little gotcha slips for every teacher. And we thought, you know, they're like, well, okay, you know, we'll put them in their box and they'll probably throw them away. No, every teacher pin, you know, pinned it up on their bulletin board or taped it to their desk and countless teachers came up to us and said, thanks. <laughs> you know, I was thinking real estate, Walmart, that'd be really, really nice right now. But, you know, it was just nice that somebody recognized the hard work I'm doing. So make sure you build that in your, your, your systems, not just focusing on recognizing kids, but recognize each other. So recognizing colleagues. So it'd be like the student or the, excuse me, the teacher of the week around classroom, around PBS. They had the, the big uh, bouquet. Susan Barrett, uh, when she was in Maryland, talked about a school that had this plunger they painted gold. And if you took a risk, you know, you got the golden plunger because you plunged in and, and, and took a risk. Um, build in social events. Now, I know this looks kind of sad. <laughs> there were a whole lot of other teachers. Um, but <laughs> what the parents did is they made breakfasts, right? So they had pancakes and oatmeal and so forth. And, and eventually, all the teachers did come in. Uh, the picture was taken <laughs> a little bit prematurely. Celebrate success, right? So in that staff room, have that PBS? No. What I would like is the data to be a little bit more prominent, but they did have data up there, so that's fantastic, right? So celebrate, build in that. School should be a place you want to be. Things like this build that climate. It's infectious. You feel it when you walk in the school. The kids feel it when they walk in the school. They know. Well, I've talked about sort of six quick lessons. And everybody in this room, whether you're a newbie or you've been at it for four or five years, maintaining implementation is hard work. Principals come and go, staff come and go, initiatives come and go, funding comes and goes. It's hard work. So why bother, right? Why bother? Here's why you should bother. These data are very, very busy, but these are MAP scores. This is the Missouri assessment, the all-powerful and mighty test score for math and communication arts. And what you see across the bottom are schools at different levels of implementation. On the far right are folks that are beginning. What we wanted to know is if schools implement the entire continuum, right? So these are schools doing school at PBS tiers one, two, and three. Do they fare better than non-PBS schools? And what we found is not so much. It's just a slight variation, just a little bit better than non-PBS schools. But if you break out kids on IEPs, here are non-PBS schools, here are gold schools. This makes me do the happy dance. This is my happy dance. It's ugly. <laughs> you don't want to see it. This is why a passionate special educator has spent 25 years focusing on building school-wide environments to increase the likelihood. We get outcomes like this, right? That's what we're all about. The most vulnerable population, we can be successful. The next slide, these are fresh data, <laughs> meaning we just have done this analysis, we're gonna dig further and we will get this out. But we're finding statistically significant differences between PBS implementers and non in terms of lower percentage of kids on IEPs. We're serving less kids. What we think is we're getting less false positives, meaning kids who are referred but really don't have a disability. We're seeing kids on IEPs attendance rates st statistically significant over non-PBS schools. And then finally, on average, in PBS schools, kids on IEPs spend 80% or better of their day. 
So we're seeing those kids with significant learning and behavioral challenges successful in those and across those general ed environments, right? This is why we stay the course. This is why, yeah, it's tough uh, and it's messy and there are barriers, but we know if we stay the course, and again, Catherine Bradshaw yesterday had some amazing data and outcome. We know we implement consistently with fidelity, we increase the likelihood. Okay, some final thoughts and I will wrap this up. One of the things you've got to remember is building school-wide systems of positive behavior support takes time. We tell schools three to five years before you feel like you're on top of it. It becomes part of what you do. So you've got to remember, this is a marathon, not a sprint. <laughs> Sign from Australia, emergency phone, 174K ahead. <laughs> Let's hope it's not real critical emergency. <laughs> All right. The other thing, you've got to remember, even the experts will have setbacks along the journey, right? I talked about the importance of we do school at PBS with children, not to them. So remember, bring the kids along. <laughs> and then finally, yes, those kids make us premature gray. Yes, they know what to do to make that vein dance on our forehead. No matter how tempting, stay positive. All right, that's it for me. Uh, enjoy the rest of the forum, everybody.